A reading from the book of Judith. The high priest Joachim and the elders of the Israelites who dwelt in Jerusalem came to see for themselves the good things that the Lord had done for Israel and to meet and congratulate Judith. When they had visited her, all with one accord blessed her, saying, You are the glory of Jerusalem, the surpassing joy of Israel. You are the splendid boast of our people. With your own hand you have done all this. You have done good to Israel. And God is pleased with what you have wrought. May you be blessed by the Lord Almighty forever and ever. And all the people answered, Amen. Judith then said, A new hymn I will sing to my God. O Lord, great are you and glorious, wonderful in power and unsurpassable. Let your every creature serve you. For you spoke, and they were made. You sent forth your spirit, and they were created. No one can resist your word. Urbum Domini. The Lord had mercy on his people. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked upon his handmaid's loneliness. Behold, from now on will all ages call me blessed. The Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. The Lord's mercy is from age to age to those who fear him. He has shown might with his arm, dispersed the arrogant of mind and heart. The Lord has mercy He has thrown down the rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the lonely. The hungry he has filled with good things. The rich he has sent away empty. The Lord has helped Israel, his servant, remembering his mercy, according to his promise to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to all his descendants forever. Lexia Sancti Vangeli Secundum Johannem. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Verbum do homini. Today we're 
celebrating a votive mass in honor of Our Lady under the title of Our Lady of Ransom. And this title is rooted in the orders, especially uh, during the time of the Crusades, um, that were particularly dedicated to Our Lady that were, would ransom sometimes themselves or raise the money to ransom Christian captives held in prison uh, in the Holy Land or through the cru from the Crusades. Today, we celebrate under the title, um, uh, maybe a more precise meaning that it is a way to honor Christ as redeemer of the human race who merited the true liberty of God's children. As I was mentioning yesterday in the homily, we know that through sin, the created order, that God created the world, created man in a, an original justice, we say, that order um, was part of creation, and that was disturbed, that was violated with sin. And now we need to be justified, we need to be restored to that order through redemption, that proper order of things, making things right, to be made just that mankind can offer right worship to God. So Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary uh, compensates for our sins. Isaiah says so poetically, we hear during Lent, by his stripes we were healed. There's this great mystery of substitution that he suffered for our sake, that to bring about this original justice, this original holiness, and his act, his redemptive act, goes beyond justice. God didn't owe us that injustice, but through a gift, through the superabundance of justice, John Paul II said, uh, we were justified, we were made holy. And Mary, uh, so in a sense, we could speak of it as a ransoming, that he has ransomed us, because in sinning, we give ourselves over to sin, even to the bondage of the devil in some sense, that he has greater power over us. So he has ransomed us. Jesus has ransomed us. He has freed us from captivity. And Our Lady of Ransom, this title, reminds us that Mary cooperates in that ransom for us, in that redemption, that she is, as the church teaches, the handmaid of redemption, because she is the handmaid of the Lord which she responded at the Annunciation, totally de dedicated to the work of her son, uh, the Redeemer. She is the companion in the Passion of Christ. She stood at the foot of the cross. And the church you know, speaks of that as being very important, that we maintain that image that she stands strong in faith at the foot of the cross, the reading we had, the gospel we had today, standing in faith, Vatican II described it as lovingly consenting in the immolation of her son, participating in the plan of this redemption, the plan of the Father for us. The preface today for this feast of uh, this title, Our Lady of Ransom, has some beautiful phrasing. It says, describes her as a loving mother given to us by God in his mercy as one who cares unceasingly with a mother's love for all God's children in their need breaking the chains of every form of captivity that we might enjoy full liberty of body and spirit. I always like to say the phrase, you know, is that too strong? Are we held in bondage? Are we caught up in our sins? Do we face difficulties in life, knots in our life that we can't untie? And if we think of the fact that we've been given Mary to be our mother, to care for us, to nurture this life, and bring us these gifts of eternal salvation, one for us, for Jesus, that she does so with the solicitude, with the care, with the attachment, with the self-gift of a mother. Her intercession, her mediation is maternal in its essence. And that speaks volumes to us. You know, hopefully we were raised by parents, a father and a mother, and we know that bond, that connection that a mother has with her child. She's not at peace unless her child is at peace. She suffers a compassion with her children. If they are not freed you know, from whatever strife they have, in our case in redemption, freed from sin, freed
freed from evil. Lumen Gentium, the Vatican II document on the church, at the end of it, they have a beautiful section on Our Lady, and it describes her maternity this way. Her maternity in the order of grace began with the consent which she gave in faith at the Annunciation, and which she sustained without wavering beneath the cross, and last until the eternal fulfillment of all the elect, taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside this salvific duty, but by her con constant intercession, continued to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. By her maternal charity, she cares for the brethren of her son, who still journey on earth, surrounded by dangers and difficulties, until they are led into the holiness of their true home. A mother cannot forget her child. And Mary has now been assumed into heaven and has a special role of intercession. And she is calling us, calling the faithful to her son and to his sacrifice. That she doesn't run from the cross, standing in faith. She doesn't flee the messiness of our lives, the crucifixions in our lives. She doesn't run away. She stands at the foot of our cross, too, you know, in our sufferings, and she's there to intercede for us. Mary knows the price of redemption. She saw it happening you know, in the event itself. She knows how great it is. It's through her compassion, through her mother's heart, she shares, the church teach, teaches, that she shares in a singular and exceptional way in redemption. Through the sacrifice, the compassion of her maternal heart, suffering with Jesus, her fiat at the Annunciation that led her to the cross. You know, she's participating uh, as John Paul pointed out, in the events themselves, you know, there with Jesus. So her absolute fidelity to God's plan is a sharing also in his fidelity to his love. He has a constant love for us, and she is part of that plan of love for us. And she proclaims this in her Magnificat. She proclaims mercy. You know, his, his mercy is from age to age to those who fear him. So she's there at Calvary witnessing this act of mercy. And in the, in the uh, Magnificat, she's proclaiming it. It precedes Calvary, but she is anticipating it. And through her life, what God's done for her and her fidelity, she proclaims God's mercy. So as Vatican II said, in a holy and singular way, she cooperated with this redemption. That her divine motherhood and giving birth to him, nourishing him, presenting him in the temple, suffering with him as he died on the cross. In a holy, singular way, she cooperated. And yet, she is also a recipient of this mercy, that she is redeemed in the most sublime way, filled with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Remember, through her immaculate conception, she was preserved. In a preservative manner, she was uh, Clint, she was prevented from contracting original sin, that sin had no part of her, that she's at enmity with the serpent. And that's by God's grace. We see in Genesis and creation, we see Adam and Eve as, a, as the head of the new humanity, or as head of humanity. And then in the new creation and redemption, Paul speaks of Jesus as being a, a second Adam, we could say a new Adam, he doesn't mention this explicitly, but the church fathers speak of Mary as being the new Eve, the true mother of all the living, establishing the human race and its original dignity. So she is truly mother of us all, mother in the order of grace. Her, she is a spiritual mother. And that, as I said, begins at the Annunciation, when she gives her consent, her faith, her fiat, to God's plan through the incarnation. Jesus, the word becomes flesh, joins himself to all of us. So that maternity begins in a real way there through Christ. If she's the mother of Christ, he's joined to us as a brother and you know we're brothers and sisters of him. That maternity is placed over us through him. And at Calvary, it undergoes this burning transformation 
in this act of mercy, in this act of love for humanity, that Jesus offers himself up for our salvation, Mary is taken up into that charity, that burning charity. John Paul describes that it, it undergoes this transformation of burning charity. It becomes, has a, a new depth to its universality for all of us. And that's the, the reading we had today. You know, woman, behold your son. Tells Mary that first. Son, behold your mother to John. So she has this role that, in a sense, has this fulfillment here on Calvary by, through the love of God that she has given to us. And then, if that's not enough, she's taken up into heaven, assumed body and soul to intercede for us, to be a model of holiness, to be a pattern of holiness, holiness and to pray for us, to pray for us, to intercede for us as a mother would. And these themes are in the Hail Mary itself, the spiritual motherhood, this motherhood in order of grace. We say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Recalling the words of the Annunciation, the Visitation, you know, Gabriel's greeting. As I said, she truly, in a sense, there be becomes our mother. And then Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death that on Calvary, her motherhood undergoes this transformation, that she's praying for sinners, praying for those who did this by their sins, by our sins, did this to her son, that she's watching being crucified. Pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. So the Hail Mary is a beautiful expression of our taking her into our home, of, of being her children of calling out to her as mother. And we know that she is shared in that passion, as I mentioned, in the most intense way. We have the prophecy of Simeon. You know, let your servant depart in peace, Simeon says, according to your word. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, a sign that will be contradicted. A sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed that's spoken to Mary at the presentation. So by standing at the foot of the cross in faith, her soul, her heart is pierced as well, sharing in his passion through her compassion. And she advanced in her pilgrimage of faith, persevering in this union with her son on the cross, lovingly consenting with the immolation of her son. So she cooperated in the events themselves, we can participate in them through prayer and sacrifice after the fact to help spread the fruits of redemption. She was there and collaborating in the events themselves. And that has truly established her as our mother. A lot of verbiage. All said to exhort us all, we're going to pray a rosary after Mass, to avail ourselves to her prayers, that we need her help to come to Jesus. We need our help to be converted, to be disciples, to be true children of the Father. We need her as a mother, and we need to, to go to her with confidence, because we can always approach our mothers with confidence. They love us. They're connected to us. They're bonded to us, and she is truly our mother. 